Happy holiday season to everyone. Jeffrey Williams was born into an environment, a community, a society that was filled with depression, despair, hopelessness, and helplessness. He was born and raised in the Jonesboro South housing projects. That's here in Southeast Atlanta. It's a very small three bedroom apartment. He lived with his four brothers in one of the small bedrooms. His six sisters lived in the other small bedroom and his mother lived in her small bedroom. In the winter time, it was freezing. In the summertime, it was scorching. Because there was not that much money to go around to pay for utilities. The refrigerator and the cabinets hardly ever had any healthy food, and sometimes no food at all. In order to have the appearance of being able to wear different clothing, Jeffrey would share clothing with his brothers and sisters, neighbors, and friends in the community. And although the clothing was oftentimes dirty, at least it gave the appearance that he can have a different look from the day before. When Jeffrey would exit into the community, most homes' windows were boarded up. There were burglar bars on every entrance. The litter was not uncommon to find shell casings and human blood remains from the shootings that occurred. There was glass on the ground from the broken window of the cars, and the cars are gone. In this environment of severe poverty, severe crime, Jeffrey developed two deep embedded beliefs about our criminal justice system. The first one is that it is not justice. Our criminal justice system was not just, at least for people that he saw. Jeffrey would see over and over again people in the neighborhood who were known to be the liars. These are the people that would lie to their kids, lie to their mothers, lie to their brothers and sisters, and then somehow those people would be used by prosecutors, allowed to come before judges. And they would have reduced charges, reduced prison sentences, reduced probationary sentences, no charges at all, on their oath that they come in the courtroom to tell the God's honest truth. Your Honor. Do you have an objection, ma'am? I have an objection. What's your basis? Your Honor, I'd rather approach and not speak it out loud in front of the jury. It will take one second. All right. Thank you. If I put your listening device on, please.
Jeffrey learned that these liars, these snitches, these rats, they would come into the courtroom, take a witness stand to tell the God's honest truth. They were still the same liars. And they would testify against people accused of crimes. Jeffrey thinks that the entire justice system is corrupt. It should be blown up. And everybody who feeds into that are awful people, stealing lives away from others. The next abiding belief that Jeffrey had growing up is his despise for the police. He would see people walking on the streets. This could be an adult, teenager, a child. They're in their backpacks, holding a football, bouncing a basketball, and the police just swarm in. They're aggressive. They search the backpack. They throw the football over the house. They kick the basketball down the road. It got to the point when people saw the police coming, they just ran. It's different experiences in different parts of America. It's different experiences in different parts of Atlanta. Jeffrey would be driving with his sister, the youngest sister, Dora. They're about a year apart. Dora is younger than Jeffrey. She's the youngest of 11 children of Jeffrey's mother. Jeffrey's the second youngest. He's the youngest young man. <clears throat> Those two, Dora and Jeffrey, have the same father. None of the other 11 children of Jeffrey's mother share the same father. And Dora and Jeffrey would be driven get pizza by their dad, and constantly. The car would be stopped for a window tint violation, a failure to maintain a lane, a failure to use a turn signal, illegal left turn. The father would be handcuffed and sat on the curb. Jeffrey and Dora on the other side of the curb, the police rummaging through the car, saying, if we find anything, these kids are going to defects custody. <clears throat> That's how he grew up. But what really solidified Jeffrey's distrust for the police happened three days before his nine-year-old birthday. Jeffrey was born on August 16th of 1991. We are now August 13th of 2000. Jeffrey's older brother, they called him Beanie. 
He was 20 years of age, 11 years older than Jeffers. He shot in the chest. He collapses outside, not far from Jeffrey's apartment. The neighborhood comes out. Jeffrey and his family come out. They're praying over Beanie. It's going to be okay. There's help on the way. 911 was called. And what seemed forever, when the police finally did arrive, they didn't go immediately to Beanie. They had to push back the crowd. Jeffrey's mother was hysterical. She was screaming for her child to survive. The police handcuffed Jeffrey's mother, put her on the ground. And when they finally went to Beanie, put a sheet over his face, Beanie was dead to the police, even though his chest was still going up and down, he was still breathing. The Jonesboro South housing projects were closed by the city of Atlanta in the year 2007. Jeffrey's now 16 years of age. His family was displaced. They were scattered. Most of them, not all of them, reunited and were now living in the Cleveland Avenue area. Jeffrey was not educated in his home about go to university, work as a flight attendant for Delta. Somebody would loan you money so you could start a business. Jeffrey believed that the only two ways he can break the generational hopelessness and despair for his family, himself, and he wanted to break it for as many people as he could who were in this struggle was to be a professional athlete or an accomplished musical artist. Jeffrey chose the latter. And from that day forward, every week, every month, every year to this day, Jeffrey practices to make himself a better musical artist. In Jeffrey's neighborhood, rap, it's a subset of hip hop. Gangster rap is a subset of rap. That was the most popular music at that time. So Jeffrey sought to find out how can he accomplish his mission to be a successful rapper. So he had the internet. They were poor, but they had phones with the internet. So he would Google and look up and get on social media every accomplished rap artist and see what made them special. And Jeffrey would listen to beat after beat after beat. These are billions of musical chords that he listened to. And he tried and he forced himself to be able to speak fast within the beat and rhyme words. Jeffrey can't sit there and write out the words. He doesn't spell well. But he can listen and learn and look up what words mean, or just make up words to put them into the beat. And Jeffrey studied two rap artists particularly. He idolized a gentleman named Dwayne Carter. His performing name is Little Wayne. Jeffrey also idolized Tupac. And Jeffrey looked at what is Little Wayne doing that's making him so successful? Because Little Wayne is right before Jeffrey. 
He is born on September 27th of 1982. He's nine years older than Jeffrey. And little Wayne, by the time that Jeffrey came along, has exploded. He is a superstar. And little Wayne changed the culture. It was more than just the sound of the music. Now, Jeffrey studied Lil Wayne so much, he sounded like Lil Wayne. You're going to hear witness after witness that Jeffrey sounded just like Lil Wayne. But Jeffrey realized that Lil Wayne had a following, a fan base. And people who dressed like Lil Wayne, it used to be that rappers wore baggy pants, big uniforms from teams. Little Wayne changed it. He wore proper fitting pants. Little Wayne tattooed his face. He's the first one. Jeffrey has tattoos on his face. Jeffrey changed the clothing. He took what Little Wayne did, and Jeffrey wore tight fitting pants. He's the first. He did that because when he would take his ill-fitting clothing from his sisters, they were tight jeans. Jeffrey wore tight necklaces. He wore dresses. He realized in order to become successful, and to accomplish his mission of breaking those bonds, he had to capture people's experiences and make it interesting, both musically and creating a brand. He's advertising. Jeffrey was called Little Jeff. <coughs> His father is Jeffrey Williams Sr. He was called Big Jeff. But Jeffrey is sounding like Little Wayne. He's trying to emulate Little Wayne on social media. He called himself Little Jeff and Little Wayne. He thought that that doesn't sound too good. That's a bridge too far. So, Jeffrey wanted to have a performing name. So he looked to Tupac. You will learn that in 1983, the incomparable talent, Michael Jackson, released a song. It went around the globe. P-Y-T, Pretty Young Thing. About 13 years later, Tupac is featured on a song with Smooth. And that song is P-Y-T, Playa, P-L-A-Y-A, Young Thugs. And on that song is a repeat of words. And this really connected with Jeffrey. It's a black man that not too many understand. That's what Jeffrey felt about people with nice color skin. <coughs> Jeffrey had interest in women. But he never considered himself a player. A player to Jeffrey was somebody we had the girls kind of coming at them at all times. Jeffrey wasn't like that. Jeffrey was shy. He was really tall and really skinny. He was malnourished. His teeth were rotten. There was no money to go to a dentist. And all the sugar from the candy that he ate to keep substance in his body, right his teeth. So Jeffrey would speak by covering his teeth with his lips, 
or often speak like this with his hand or his arm over his teeth because he had low self-esteem. He was made fun of and bullied growing up. So he got rid of the player. That was not going to work for him. But he kept the young thugs. He got rid of the S. And he became a performer, young thug. And from that day forward, he insisted everybody call him young thug. On every type of tweet, Facebook, social media of any kind, on any records, he refers to himself as Young Thug. And that fit in to the appearance of the gangster rap. Because most people think about a thug as a criminal. But to Jeffrey, thug had a different meaning. Now, some of you have read books about Tupac and what it meant to be thug life. Thug life, the hate you give little infants, Fs, everyone. Meaning discrimination and racism hurts all of us. We teach that to our kids. That was not what thug meant to Jeffrey. Thug meant and means to Jeffrey something very personal. It was his pact that if he could ever make it as a musical artist and help his family, himself, and his many others out of this endless cycle of hopelessness, he would be truly humble under God. That's what thug means. Jeffrey is talented. He worked so hard, he'd outwork everyone. He would stay up all night after night trying to rhyme words, put him to beats. When he had time and the opportunity to go into the studio, he wouldn't leave. He is a prolific creator of music. The neighborhood realized his talent. He was the best rapper in the neighborhood. So Jeffrey was invited to the underage clubs to perform. And he would be the introductory entertainer. He would be able to perform five or 10 minutes $50, get paid $100 sometimes. He's about 17 years old, 2008, 2009. When Jeffrey would leave the establishment, he'd get robbed. And the money was gone. And that money may not be a lot of money for some of you in 2008 or 9, but to Jeffrey, it was food, it was meals for him and his family. The next time Jeffrey went for an event, he did not get on raw. There was a man in the community who was a man of influence in the community. He was allegedly the leader of Raise on Cleveland, the supposed gang, rock crew. He was supposedly the leader of the Bloods in that area, in Cleveland Avenue. His name is Quentin Porter. Goes by Boo or Big Boo. And when Jeffrey comes to make the performance, he's no longer there for five or 10 minutes. 
he is the lead performer. He's going to go last. As the time went on, the neighborhood got behind Jeff. The rock crew, the bloods, the whole neighborhood, they would put up signs on the post, come out tomorrow night, watch our own young thug perform at this establishment. The place is sold out now. This is no longer 25, 35 people. There are hundreds of people in the club. There are hundreds of people in the parking lot trying to get into the club. There are hundreds of people backing up in the streets, all to see young thugs. The people who own these establishments are making money. They are attracting customers. Word gets out. Jeffrey's no longer just performing in the area that he grew up in, in the poverty-stricken area. He's now in Atlanta, South Georgia, Alabama, Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee. He is performing all of the time. By 2011, Jeffrey released his first album. It's entitled, I Came From Nothing. And yes, he speaks about killing 12 and people being shot and drugs and drive-by shootings. This is the environment that he grew up in. These are the people he knew. These are the stories he knew. These are the words that he rhymed. This isn't a ballad or a book. These are phrases in a song. And whatever the listener takes from it, you will learn that's what the song means. This is art. This is freedom of speech in America. As the years go on, 2013, 2014, Jeffrey's now 22, 23. It's unbelievable. He has three hit songs that are going around the world. Sonar, Danny Glover, and Lifestyle. He is making music videos professionally. He is working with some of the biggest artists in hip hop. It's un it worked. It's unbelievable. He is not running this criminal street gang in Cleveland Avenue area of Cleveland to gain property, money, or power, Jeffrey Williams did it on will and hard work and determination without anybody's help, except the people from that area that he will not turn his back on. By 2014, to today, to today, you will learn. Jeffrey Williams has been nominated and won and recognized MTV, United Kingdom, American Soul Train Music Awards. He is a Grammy Award winner. XXL Awards, BET Awards, Billboard Music Awards. Every single year since 2014, that's what he has accomplished. He is not sitting there telling people to kill people. He doesn't need their money. Jeffrey's worth tens of millions of dollars. Jeffrey has been a sponsor for Puma, Calvin Klein, 
He had been featured on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine, GQ magazine, XXL magazine, Paper magazine, Complex magazine, Variety interview magazine. He is at the top of his craft. Jeffrey is so talented in music, he doesn't only do gangster rap. He does <coughs> rap, gangster rap. He has hits in country music, popular music or pop music, Latin music, Afro, beats. He's been featured on NPR, Tiny Desk. He's played numerous times on Saturday Night Live, Jimmy Fallon Show. Jeffrey has performed in almost every continent on the earth. He's performed in front of more than 300,000 people that come for him. His social media feed has more than 10 million followers. He's not the cradle. He's trying to pull people out of poverty. Jeffrey has performed with the likes of Rihanna, Ed Sheeran, Sir Elton John, Drake. Everybody in music. And Jeffrey didn't only stay in music. He did fashion. He's an icon in fashion. He has been to Paris, to Spain, all over Europe at the fashion shows. He has his own clothing lines. People are walking around the earth today with Jeffrey's picture tattooed on their calves, on their shoulders. They have his lyrics on their bodies. YSL. When Jeffrey was coming up and making it, Little Wayne had and repped, talked about Cash Money Records. That's his label. Jeffrey's friend in Cleveland Avenue, they called themselves YSL. Because on the pants, the tight-fitting pants, the women's pants that they're wearing, it says YSL, East St. Laurent. That's where that comes from. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeffrey <coughs> stands before you charged with some of the most serious crimes in the state of Georgia. I'd like to go through with you each and every crime that he's charged with in the indictment. The indictment's thick. You're going to have it. At the end of the case, the Honorable Judge Granville will give it to you. You should read it. It's the charging document and it's critical in the case. There are many counts. Most of them Jeffrey's not charged with. But everybody, there were 28 people who the prosecution through the grand jury indicted together. They're all in count one. That's why this is a joint trial. Because everyone's in count one. That was the decision of the prosecutors. You will learn that Jeffrey doesn't even know most of the people in this indictment. He doesn't know them. They all know him because everybody in that area knows Jeffrey Williams. He is known as the Michael Jordan of that area. And he didn't get out and stay away. He tries to come back and give people hope because he knows what it is to be depressed, and hungry, and have nothing going for him. 
The first count is a RICO conspiracy. And the supposed objective that the prosecution charged is that Jeffrey, along with others, had a meeting in the mind. They, they, they had an agreement. They have an agenda together. And that they wanted to preserve and protect and enhance the reputation, the power, the territory of YSL. That's the allegation. Jeffrey hasn't lived in the Cleveland Avenue area in a decade, more. He has homes from Los Angeles to Atlanta. But they charge him with he wants the reputation, power, territory of the enterprise by obtaining money, weapons, or other property. Jeffrey needs no money from somebody on robbing someone of a car. We're doing a $30 drug deal, or even a $100 million drug deal. He's got his own source of legitimate income. When, so RICO conspiracy, there are then what's called overt acts. The judge will charge you on the law. But there are 191 overt acts. And those are separate instances that the prosecution said they're going to prove. Most of them don't include Jeffrey. But the ones that do, I'd like to go through with you. And I've broken it up into three categories. Because an overt act can be a crime. It doesn't have to be a crime. So I then wrote chats, social media, any type of statement. Because the prosecution has been investigating Jeffrey for a decade. They have all of his personal chats. You think you're talking to somebody on Facebook in a personal chat? They have all of his thoughts. They put these in the indictment. The third category are lyrics. So I'd like to go through them with you. First is going to be supposed crimes. And these are the overt acts that you will see that involve Jeffrey. As you can see, Jeffrey has never been convicted of a crime. He stands before you. He's not a convicted felon. He can vote. He can carry a gun. He can be on a jury. But now, these acts are embedded in the indictment. So let's start with the first one. So this is September 9th of 2013. Jeffrey just turned the age of 22. And he's driving in a car. And he gets stopped, of course, for failure to maintain a lane. And the police officer comes up to the car. Jeffrey doesn't have a license. He doesn't have a valid driver's license. So now he's under arrest. Police officer says he sees pills, Xanax pills, seven of them, on the console. Police officer searches the car, and underneath the front passenger seat, there's no passenger, is a gun. That weapon comes back stolen from Andrew and Ann Phillips months before. There is no evidence that Jeffrey's involved in that burglary of the Phillips home. There's no evidence Jeffrey ever touched that gun. You're not going to hear any type of DNA, fingerprints. In fact, Jeffrey says, that's not my gun. The police officer wants to know, whose gun is it? Jeffrey's not, he's not talking to the police. But Jeffrey gets arrested. That case got dismissed. <clears throat> but 10 years ago, now it's an overt act for you to consider. You will learn that this stop 
was video recorded and audio recorded. But the city of Atlanta Police Department, the district attorney's office of Fulton County, I demanded that, they can't find it. So you're gonna rely on a report of an officer who doesn't remember this incident. That's it. That's an act in furtherance of a conspiracy. That's the entirety of it, that first overt act. The next one. This is overt act five through seven. You may notice that Jeffrey's not even alleged to be in this overt act, but now you're going to hear Jeffrey's supposed involvement. This is two days later. It's September 11th, an infamous day in America. It's 2013. Jeffrey was arrested, if you remember, for the last overt act, September 9, 2013. He made bond, he just got out. Walter Murphy, he grew up with Jeffrey. He's one of the people that we exchanged dirty clothing with Jeffrey. You will learn that they would have no money between them. One of them would come across a dollar. They would split the food that they could buy with that dollar together. Walter Murphy is with a person named Adrian Bean and Fred Plethora. And there is an armed robbery of Mr. Dotson. Gunfire went out. Police are always in this area. So when the gunfire was heard, police respond immediately. Adrian Bean is driving the car. This is a car that he borrowed from a friend. It has nothing to do with Jeffrey. So he commits a car in someone else's, commits a crime in someone else's car. Adrian Bean almost kills a police officer, almost runs him over, driving so recklessly, high rate of speed, goes across a neighbor's lawn, over an embankment, the car is now airborne, it goes over, you'll see pictures, goes over a parked police car in a parking lot and slams into, slams into the side of a laundromat. The car crashes. Mr. Plethora was shot, police are firing at the car. Mr. Murphy is shot. Mr. Bean runs away. He's captured. Mr. Bean, you will learn, is told. Hey, we believe there was a fourth person in that car. If you make that young thug, we'll go leaning on him. Adrian Bean is in the Fulton County Jail talking with his wife. He said, I should have ran the way thug ran. He got away. That's recorded any time an inmate, a person is incarcerated, excuse me, in a jail. Most of the time, unless they're speaking with a pastor, a lawyer, the calls are being recorded. You will learn that Mr. Bean also stated on a recorded call, they gave us a story to tell. Mr. Bean is interviewed four days later, September 17, 2013, by Detective Quinn, City of Atlanta Police Department. Detective Quinn is, it's a big case because police officers are discharging their weapon. People are getting shot. Detective Quinn <coughs> interviews Adrian Bean. And Adrian Bean tells him, they talk about this recording. Adrian Bean tells him, I lied to my wife. Everything on those recordings are not true. <coughs> Jeffrey was never arrested for this. He was never charged for this. 
He was never prosecuted for this. He's not even in our indictment on Overt Act 5, 6, or 7. But now, we're going to hear from Mr. Bean. That's it for the next one. Somehow that furthered this conspiracy. Jeffrey was not even charged. Next Overt Act is uh, January 7th of 2015. Now, this is a larger part of our case probably. God forbid Donovan Thomas is going to be killed three days later. It's going to be January 10th of 2015. And in order to understand this rental car, and there's nothing clearly wrong with renting a car. But in order to understand this rental car, and then the three days later, the killing of Donovan Thomas, you have to understand some background. So we're shortly before New Year's of 2015. And there's a man named Kenneth Copeland. He goes by Woody. And Kenneth Copeland is not friends with Jeffrey Williams. He uses Jeffrey Williams, just like a lot of people. Because Kenneth Copeland wants to be famous and have money. So he leeches on to Jeffrey Williams about a year before that. Well, Kenneth Copeland is a criminal. He is a notorious criminal. In fact, you will learn that he was ranked one of the 10 most violent people in Georgia by the federal prosecutor here in Atlanta. That is Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Copeland breaks into cars. He steals the property they're in. Donovan Thomas is the head of a gang called IF, Inglewood Family. Donovan Thomas and Jeffrey are friends. Jeffrey's friends with everybody. It promotes him. And Jeffrey tries to help other people at the same time. Kenneth Copeland breaks into Donovan Thomas's car. And he takes his expensive <coughs> chain, Donovan Thomas's wallet, his driver's license, and Donovan Thomas's cellular telephone. Donovan Thomas calls his cellular telephone. Kenneth Copeland answers that the call on Donovan Thomas's phone. Kenneth Copeland changes his voice, tries to disguise his voice, but Donovan Thomas knows it's Kenneth Copeland. Donovan Thomas has people on the street. And he tells Kenneth Copeland, you have my stuff. I'm going to come and get it back. And Kenneth Copeland says, yeah, I'm glad you called me. Because one of my partners had your stuff. I realized it was yours, so I got it for you for safekeeping. No problem. When Donovan Thomas meets with Kenneth Copeland, he doesn't come alone. He comes with two other people, and they display guns. Kenneth Copeland's not alone. He's with his brother. They're really not related, but they call themselves brothers. His name is Domekian Garlington. Domekian Garlington and Kenneth Copeland are like this. They are inseparable. Domekian Garlington and Kenneth Copeland are together. <coughs> when Donovan Thomas comes, he makes it known <coughs> that Kenneth Copeland is on the menu. Meaning Kenneth Copeland is going to be hurt. He just stole Donovan Thomas' property. 
It is now January 6th. It's really January 5th. It's a Monday night going into Tuesday morning, January 6th of 2010. It's going to be the day before this first rental car. And Kenneth Copeland is with, with a lot of people. Jeffrey's there. Jeffrey was performing on stage at Club Crucial. Monday night was Club Crucial night. That's where they all went. And Kenneth Copeland goes in the back, in the kitchen area, and he's met there by a man named Kelvin Watts. He goes by Shell Kel, and who's a half brother of Donovan Thomas, and other people who are affiliated with Donovan Thomas. And Kenneth Copeland gets beat. He has bumps on his head, his eye is injured, he's being kicked. No one does that to Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Copeland's a person who puts the bumps on the head, injures the person, kicks him. Kenneth Copeland's man. And you will learn that Kenneth Copeland then went on a mission. He went to every place that he knew that Donovan Thomas or one of his brothers or friends were or family members and he would shoot at them with his weapon. On the seventh day of January 2015, Kenneth Copeland told Jeffrey, I'm going to be with my child just born. The mother of my child, her name is Miss Quarterman. And I don't want to be driving around in the typical car I drive around in, Dodge Charger. Can I use one of your rental cars? Jeffrey does this for everybody. People need to take someone to a doctor. People want to go out of the state. They don't have transportation. He rents cars all the time. Jeffrey says, yeah, there's a rental car here. It's a Corvette. Ken Copeland says, that's a two-seater. My child has a baby seat. That's too small. Jeffrey rents a car at the Atlanta airport on the evening of January 7, 2015, along with Kenneth Copeland. <coughs> After they drop off the Corvette, the same location. <coughs> this rental car is in Jeffrey's name. And they leave the rental car location Kenneth Copeland wants to pick up his brother, Damika and Garlington. And after Jeffrey is dropped off, Jeffrey does not see that infinity vehicle until after the killing of Donovan Thomas. That infinity vehicle, that rental car, is in the possession, the control of Kenneth Copeland that whole time. The 8th of January, Kenneth Copeland is shooting at Donovan Thomas and his friends, associates. He's using this infinity vehicle. He's using another vehicle. He is on a spree. It's now January 10th of 2015. There's a New England Patriot, Baltimore Raven playoff football game. It's Saturday evening. Donovan Thomas is watching the game from inside a barbershop with a lot of other people, his friends. At approximately 7.22 that evening, Saturday, January 10th, 2015, 
found in Thomas's outside of that barber shop. And Chevrolet Tahoe is parked in that parking lot. Car drives by, you'll see a video, a surveillance video from the stores. You'll see sparks, it's gunfire. Donovan Thomas is struck. Bingo. The EMT is trying to save him. He's taken to Grady Hospital, surgery after surgery, and he leaves us. Two other people were shot as well, but their injuries <coughs> were not fatal. Later that day, that evening, Jeffrey, you will learn, is in negotiation with his record label. They want to give Jeffrey over $800,000 up front. And the contract's worth millions to produce these records. That's what Jeffrey was working on. He was working on a music video. No one's going to say that Jeffrey is at that scene of the shooting. But later, Kenneth Copeland, when he's arrested, he tells the police lie after lie after lie after lie. <coughs> Kenneth Copeland says, Jeffrey Williams was involved in that shooting. Although Kent Coven said, I, I don't know anything about him, just tell me what I heard. <clears throat> Kent Coven's one of those liars in the neighborhood that everyone knows that becomes a witness, swears to tell God's honest truth. You will learn. And after the shooting of Donovan Thomas, his associates did not take that way. Immediately, word on the street is that Kenneth Copeland, Woody, is responsible. Kenneth Copeland, it's now after 10 p.m., it's hours after the shooting. He's then at Jeffrey's home along with a lot of people. They're all scared they're going to be killed. They're all telling, I had nothing to do with it. Jeffrey, you will learn, he's friends with Donovan Thomas. Jeffrey puts Donovan Thomas in his music videos. Donovan Thomas invited Jeffrey just recently to come into his neighborhood to shoot a music video with him in it. Jeffrey's not happy. He is sad. <laughs> Kenneth Copeland says, the police are calling <coughs> Kenneth Copeland. The police are right on him. And you will learn, and it's on recording, that Kenneth Copeland goes into the police station later that morning, so it's a very early morning hours, January 11th, of 2015, and he's with Detective Thorpe. Detective Thorpe is recording this. And Kenneth Copeland says, yeah, I got your call. I was at Jeffrey Williams' house, Thug's house. Everyone knows Jeff. And I told him that the police won't talk to me. And Jeffrey said, you had nothing to do with this, you should go talk to the police. That's what Jeffrey said. Detective Thorpe asked Kenneth Copeland, this is hours after the killing. Do you have anything to do with a rental car, an Infinity rental car? Were you in an accident in an Infinity rental car? <coughs> And Kenneth Copeland says, no. He's just a liar. 
Kenneth Copeland tells Detective Thorpe, earlier today, during the time of the killing, I was at the green store. The green store is like a grocery store. It's green in color. It's called the green store. It's not far from where Donovan Thomas was got killed. You will learn that there's video surveillance inside and outside of the green store. Supposedly, Detective Thorpe, who is a qualified law enforcement officer, he's been doing this forever. I'm being told that, no, we never got the video of the green store to support the supposed alibi of Kenneth Copeland. No one corroborates Kenneth Copeland and where he was. You will learn that Kenneth Copeland eventually says, it's now June of 2015, gets rearrested. He doesn't want to be in jail. He speaks with the police. He's now with Detective Dennis, Detective Gaither, also city of Atlanta police officers. They're detectives with the gang unit homicide. Kenneth Copeland says, oh yeah, the night of the killing, Donovan Thomas, I wasn't involved. But I saw Jeffrey Williams. He's at the McDonald's on Cleveland Avenue. I saw him with all these other people. And then I followed him to his home. It's about 8 o'clock at night. There are videos at the McDonald's. They don't have any video. They never bother to get any video. We even try. But we have phone records. And phone records can show that they're not GPS. This is not like you're within five feet of this area if you call E911 or something. But it gives you range, maybe a mile and a half, maybe more. And it tells you which tower you're hitting off of. Kenneth Copeland tells the police. I followed Jeffrey Williams' car to his house about 8 o'clock. That's not true. When you track Kenneth Copeland's phone record, he doesn't go near Jeffrey. He doesn't see Jeffrey that night. He doesn't follow Jeffrey home. He doesn't go to Jeffrey's home until after 10. This is all a lie. <coughs> Kenneth Copeland was told by the police, we want Thug. That's how he gets a deal. Because Kenneth Copeland was also told, you're an armed career criminal. You're going to spend 25 years in federal custody for having a gun. You're going to be dying in the state of Georgia custody because we're going to charge you with gang crime after gang crime after gang crime. But you can help yourself out. On Kenneth Copeland's word, Jeffrey Williams stands here concerning that overt act. So Jeffrey Williams rents a car in his own name to use in a homicide of his friend. Kenneth Copeland. Antonio Sledge, they're all at Jeffrey's home, and they're all scared. They're saying, Donovan Thomas and friends are going to kill us. They think we're involved. Jeffrey gives money to Antonio Sledge so he and his family can get a hotel room and not suffer a potential drive-by shooting. Because Kenneth Copeland said, they're all going to be killed. They're all, Kenneth Copeland made them all supposed targets by the IF gang. Kenneth Copeland, Shannon Jackson, you might say Kendrick, others go down to Miami shortly after the shooting. Jeffrey was performing in the 
Jeffrey wanted them to be safe, not get hurt, until people calmed down. Jeffrey then sent them back to Atlanta. Jeffrey then went on tour. Because you will learn by March, April 2015, Jeffrey did his first nationwide tour. He did with a performer known as Travis Scott. In the summer of 2015, Jeffrey then toured Europe, performing there and going to fashion shows. Jeffrey Williams is not involved. On the next Overt Act, you will see this is, these are the people, this is Overt Act number 17 and 18 and 19 and 20. And this is charging murder and then attempted murder for shooting the second person who was shot that night and then the third person, Mr. Sanders, who was shot that night and then participation in criminal street gang activity. You may notice that the Overt Act doesn't even include Jeffrey. No one charges Jeffrey with murder. But here we are. The next Overt Act is April 26, 2015. <clears throat> Jeffrey is touring. He is performing. He's in Louisiana. Little Wayne, his idol, Jeffrey idolizes him, came out against Jeffrey, called him gay. Jeffrey did a promotional social media release where there's people with guns on either side of him and Jeffrey's saying, come to this concert, we'll see what happens, come on to the concert. Jeffrey was told to do that video and release by his management team. Because when Little Wayne says, don't listen to his music, that impacts him. Little Wayne is bigger than Jeffrey Williams at that time. So this creates interest in fans. You will learn that this is part of being involved in hip hop or rap. There's all these battles going across social media. It generates interest, much like the NFL have rivalries with the Saints and the Falcons and how much they hate each other. It is generating advertising. It's branding. Jeffrey is in Louisiana. Here in Atlanta, Little Wayne has a tour bus. <coughs> and he performs concert. And his tour bus was fired on and struck. There's zero evidence Jeffrey's involved. Zero. Jeffrey's not even named. And now you're going to hear about it. Because Jeffrey's the king slime. He just controls everybody, even without any evidence to support it. Because that's the theory of the prosecution and the police who have targeted Jeffrey Williams. <clears throat> the next Overt Act is July 7th of 2015. Jeffrey is at Perimeter Mall, that's located in the Camp County. And he's in the mall and he's buying 50 to 100 sneakers, brand new sneakers. And he's going to do a video shoot. And he's going back to Cleveland Avenue where the children don't have proper footwear. He's going to give out these sneakers and allow the children to be in the video shoot. So that's why he's at the Primitive Mall. He's there with friends of his. And he's on a Segway scooter. It's like an electric um, skateboard. And the mall security comes over and tells Jeffrey and his friends, and you'll see video of this. They have to leave the mall. You can't have a Segway inside the mall. 
But Jeffrey leaves them all. But the security officers follow him. They follow Jeffrey and his friends to Jeffrey's Jaguar. And the security <laughs> won't let Jeffrey leave. Well, let his friends leave. They're standing around the Jaguar. They can't shut the door to the Jaguar. They can't pull out. And they tell Jeffrey, you're waiting here. You're going to have to be here. They tell Jeffrey's friend, we're going to get a criminal trespass warrant for you. Allegedly, someone inside the car said, I'm going to go home, get a gun, and come back and shoot you in the face. That's the allegation. The security guards then supposedly step back, the car drives away. Nobody is shot. There's no incident. Jeffrey gets arrested on that. The Cab County prosecutors dismissed that case. He was not even indicted. Now you have it here before you. The next overt act dealing with crime is September 24th of 2017. Jeffrey's with Sergio Kitchens. Sergio Kitchens is an unbelievably well-known musical performer. His performing name is Gunna. And he and Jeffrey both are under YSL. That's Jeffrey's record label. He signed Sergio Kitchen for God. There's a third person in that car. His name is Cedric Jones. The car is going to Peachtree DeKalb Airport. He gets pulled over for a window tint violation. The officer gets Jeffrey out of the car and handcuffs Sergio Kitchen's out of the car and handcuffs Cedric Jones out of the car. Police search the car. They find in the car supposed methamphetamine, supposed hydrocodone, marijuana, and a stolen firearm. Jeffrey was on his way to perform at the Jimmy Fallon show that night. Cedric Jones said, I packed that stuff. Somehow that is now influencing and perpetuating and moving this supposed YSL conspiracy. That's, that's the over there. The next one. May 18, 2018. Jeffrey is driving a Porsche. Sergio Kitchens is in the front passenger seat. Supposedly, Jeffrey is speeding. Supposedly, there's another car that's in tandem speeding. Both cars get pulled over by police. There's videos. Jeffrey and Mr. Kitchens are asked to get out of the car. They're asked if there are guns in the car. They say yes. There are guns in the car. Police get them out of the car. Any drugs in the car? No. Police have Jeffrey and Mr. Kitchens on the side of the road. Go through Jeffrey's car. They run the guns. The guns are lawful. The police put the guns in the trunk of the car. Tell Jeffrey and Mr. Kitchens, you're free to go. Give Jeffrey a speeding ticket. Jeffrey's driving away, he stops the police, inquires about what's going to happen with the other gentleman in the other car. Police say, no, 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 you're going to jail. They have in the car weapons, 30 round magazines. It's not in Jeffrey's car. There's going to be zero evidence that Jeffrey put those guns in the car, knew those guns were in the car, had anything to do with them. That's your overt act. The next crime is an overt act. This is the date 
of Jeffrey's arrest. So it's broken up into several overt acts. So I grouped them. This is overt act 183, 184, 185, 186, 187, and 188. And what you'll see here is they're just different, different items. So Jeffrey's home is surrounded. on March 9th of 2020 by law enforcement. Law enforcement has tremendous military power. Law enforcement takes control of the scene, the area. Jeffrey and more than, two, more than a dozen people are in that house. You will learn that Jeffrey doesn't live at the house often. But other people live there all the time. They take care of the house. You don't leave a house unattended. The house has a lot of Jeffrey's awards that you'll see. And in the house, law enforcement finds a small amount of cocaine. I'm talking about a small amount of cocaine. They find codeine, lots of codeine. Codeine's um, cough syrup. People drink it if you get hot. Get very dirty. Marijuana in the house. And firearms. Other people had access to this home, other people lived at this home. You will have no evidence that Jeffrey ever touched a firearm. Those are the overt acts involving Jeffrey. And somehow that furthered this conspiracy to create territory and property and money and respect and reputation. The next series of overt acts deal with videos that are released on the internet, photographs on the internet, chats. These are not released on the internet. The chats are personal. So this is when you really know what Jeff is talking with, with people, and then conversation. So the first one is November 30, 2014. That is Jeffrey in the red sweatshirt. <coughs> That is Mr. Copeland. That's Kenneth Copeland, Woody, in the white sweatshirt. And they're wearing different colors. And the RG is Rich Gang. That is a musical gang, a musical artist. Rich Homie Kwan, man named Brian Williams, Birdman, Jeffrey Williams. They had lifestyle that went across the world. Success. And Jeffrey is holding up his fingers Suppose that's a YSL. That's what he's doing. He's wearing red clothing. That's the overt act. Jeffrey didn't release that. That's not his Instagram releasing. But that's the overt act. The next one is January 3rd of 2015. That is Mr. Demeking Garlington in the red with the glasses on. That is Jeffrey closest to us. There's money on that table. There's a double cup, styrofoam cup. And it says that Jeffrey posed for a photograph. Jeffrey's not even looking at the camera. Jeffrey didn't release that on social media. He didn't post it. That is Mr. Garlington. And that's Mr. Garlington's we ain't going back and forth. Mr. Garlington and Mr. Copeland are brothers. They consider themselves one. What happens January 3rd, 2015? It's an important thing. Shortly before New Year's, you will remember that Kenneth Copeland stole Jonathan Thomas's chain, expensive chain, his driver's license, his 
wallet, and his cell phone. That's Mr. Garlington saying, we ain't going back and forth. That's, that's the overdone. Dealing with Jeffrey Williams. Jeffrey didn't even post it. Next one is January 26, 2015. Again, this is Mr. Garlington. Now, what I'm showing you, by the way, are the overt acts from the indictment. You'll have the indictment. These are the these are language of the indictment. And this goes to a video you will see. And it's Jeffrey. And by this time, his teeth, his rotten teeth are covered with gold. He's trying to fix himself, make himself a better image. It is 16 days after Donovan Thomas is killed. And it says, Jeffrey's saying, so an, an A lies to the kids, lies to their mamas, lie to their brothers and sisters, then get right in the courtroom and tell the God's honest truth. Don't get it. Y'all ends need to be effing killed, bro, for me and YSL. That's exactly what Jeffrey's been thinking all the time. The criminal justice system is out of control. But what do you learn here? First of all, Mr. Garlington released that on his Instagram, not Jeffrey. Second of all, when was the video made by Jeffrey? Was it made, as the state told you, 16 days after Donovan Thomas is killing, and therefore somehow it's relevant to this murder? You will learn that that video was in existence before Donovan Thomas was ever killed. That is a repost. That is a repost by Mr. Garvington. The prosecutors, the police, are misrepresenting the evidence. What does happen on January 26, 2015, though? Donovan Thomas's close associate. He's also a very well-known musical performer. His name's Mr. Bennett. He goes by Y. F. N. Lucci. His mother's house is shot at. His mother, Mr. Bennett's mother, Y. F. N. Lucci's mother, is shot as well as her boyfriend. That's what happens on January 26, 2015. This is released by Mr. Garland. Because everybody wants to associate with Jeffrey. He's the only one who got out of that area. Everyone talks about him. You're going to see in the chats. They don't even know him. Hey, if I do this, how much will Jeffrey pay me? Hey, if I do this, will Jeffrey take me on tour? Hey, if I do this, will Jeffrey do this? Can I get Jeffrey's number? Can I come to his house? Will he buy me jewelry? They use Jeffrey. This has nothing to do with Donovan Thomas. But that's what you're being told. The next one is February 9th, 2015. Jeffrey is in a car, you'll see the video. He's singing. He's singing. And he's making signs with his hands that the prosecuting police say are gang signs. I can make gang signs. That is, this is America. I can speak favorably to the Bloods, to the Crips, to Donald Trump, to anybody. That's the Overt Act, and Jeffrey didn't even release it. This is on Mr. Garlington, who Mr. Garlington wrote, you did 30. YSL coming soon, instead of the C for the Crips, you remove the C if you're in favor of the Bloods, and you use another letter, sometimes a B, this one you use an S. 
you will learn that in the YSL gang, it's now called the hybrid gang. Because it's not only Bloods, there's Crips, there's anybody who wants to come, no rules. But now the experts in the Atlanta Police Department, they're the only experts, they're all the same, <coughs> the Atlanta Police Department. Now it's a hybrid gang. <coughs> that is the overt act. It's not written by Jeffrey, it's not released by Jeffrey, but they want you to fear music that talks about killing, drugs, it is art. If you don't like it, you don't have to listen to it. But this is America. It is art. And you will learn that rap is the most listened to music in the world. It's the number one. It is a multi-billion dollar industry. You don't fear this, we encourage it. It generates money. It puts people to work. It's not meant for brainwashing. It's whatever the consumer chooses. It's art. It's like reading a book, looking at a painting, watching a movie, reading poetry. It's what you believe it to be. That's what we do, as opposed to Russia. They stop all communications. They censor. The next overt act is March 20, 2015. Jeffrey is with Shannon Stilwell, Diamante Kendrick, Mr. Garlington, Mr. Arnold. And they are using their hands to make signs. That's the overt act that furthers, that drives this conspiracy. That's it. Jeffrey didn't even release that photograph. Who releases it? Mr. Garland. Next. It's almost New Year's 2017. Antonio Sumlin also comes from the impossible life that Jeffrey was born into. He's with Jeffrey. And there's a social media captioned original slime SHI. And Jeffrey's saying murder gang BIT. And holding up his fingers, his YSL, until we're dead in hell. That's the over that. That's driving this conspiracy. The next allegation is August 8th of 2019. That is Mr. Bennett. He's a very, very, very prominent musical performer, rap, gangster rap. It's August 8, 2019. And this is Jeffrey's post. Jeffrey did post this. And he wrote, YFN, meaning Mr. Bennett, if I ain't like what you do for your mother and kids, and capitalize, I would have been kill you. That's supposed to be this rival, this leader of the YSL, the King Slime, against IFG. And here we go. What they don't tell you, but what you will learn, is the day before, Jeffrey released an album called So Much Fun. YFM Lushi criticized that album on social media. That it's awful. And what you also will learn is that in 2016, years before, YFM Lushi, he's, he's not as high as Jeffrey. He does not have as much 
fan base or interest. He doesn't make the money that Jeffrey does. So Wyatt Ben Lushi does what all these rappers do, and they attach to somebody bigger to promote themselves. Jeffrey did that too. He did it with Little Wayne. He did it with others. In 2016, Mr. Bennett or Wyatt Ben Lushi, he released on social media that he has been having sex with Jeffrey's fiance. So King Slime, all these years, this man saying that he sleeps with Jeffrey's fiance goes unharmed. Nothing done. This is the post that Jeffrey says. And it's a real threat. If I didn't like what you do, for your mother and your kids, I would have been killed. It doesn't sound too much of a threat. That's the over there. The next one is March 12th of 2020. This is Huey and Mr. Williams. Now, this is not social media. These are actually conversations that the prosecution subpoenaed from Google or from Instagram or from Twitter or from Facebook. You get all of Jeffrey's statements. This is very invasive. And what happened right before this, and if you look at the date, this is right before COVID hit in 2020 in America. Sergio Kitchens has a dear friend, co-worker. He is a producer an engineer, musical engineer. So Sergio Kitchen performs, this other person turns the music, the beats, makes it right, changes lyrics, does whatever they do. This producer or engineer's name is Chandler Durham. He goes by Turbo. And Turbo's car is sold. And in that car are beats lyrics that cannot be reproduced. They're the only copy. They're on in a hard drive in this car. The car is stolen. And it is alleged that Mr. Huey's friends or acquaintances or people that Mr. Huey knew took that car. Not that Mr. Huey did it, but that he knew who did do it, who has that property. And Jeffrey writes to him, if you don't take it back, you're going to die. Give back your property. You will learn that no one died. You will learn that the property was never given back. That is the real leader of this feared criminal street gang. He's ignored. That's it. That's March 12, 2020. The next one is February 4, 2021. Now, this again is the personal chat. Trying to Stevens. He grew up with Jeffrey. They exchanged clothing, dirty clothing. They went hungry together. And Warney Lee. Warney Lee is also a up-and-coming musical artist that Jeffrey wanted to sign. But Warnie Lee went to another record label. <coughs> Jeffrey supports him, supports him to encourage his career. And this is February 4th of 2021. And what the indictment did by the prosecution through the grand jury is they put this together. And this is bad. I understand when you read it. to your arm, argument. I stand, this, re thank you. this reads, YSL rule the world, kid. 24M on an N head. Y'all just stop bringing me the money. Man, y'all ends stop playing with me. So when you read that, it sounds like there's a contract on someone's head. Kill him, stop bringing me the money. Stop playing with me. That's threatening. What you will learn is what the prosecutor did 
was they took these checks from various days. This is over a three-day period. This is February 4th, 2021, all the way up to February 7th of 2021. And they cut out all of the context. And what you will learn is that on February 4th of 2021, Jeffrey wrote, YSL rule the world, kid, 24M on an end's head. What happened on February 4th, 2021, that was released on social media and went around the world is one of Jeffrey's artists that he signed, who developed, he encouraged, and who made it. This person had a supposed, maybe it's real, supposed $24 million pink diamond and had it surgically implanted into his forehead. There is a photograph next to YSL Rule the World Kid, 24M on an N's head. There's a photograph. If you click on it, it is the rapper with the surgically implanted pink diamond in his forehead. The police bury this. The prosecution buries this. I will show it to you. Now, the evidence will show. They may say, oh, it's on. We may say, there's no mistakes here. This is a big deal. This is a bill of indictment in Fulton County, Georgia, in 2024. Your Honor, argument. A standing objection. That is misrepresenting. You will learn. You will see it. It has nothing to do with put a contract on someone's life. That's the evidence that's coming at you. You'll start, bring me the money. Y'all, and stop playing with me. When you read, this is a long <laughs> chat. These people are struggling. Trontavious Stevens is struggling. He's sharing a home with other people. They're trying to pay rent. They're working jobs. These are, these are hard jobs to work. They're trying to save money, trying to eat, trying to take care of their kids. And Trontavious Stevens is in the chat saying, I paid the rent last month. Jeffrey doesn't live with these people. He's just included in the chat. He's hardly on these chats. And Trontavia Stevens is complaining. And he's saying, give me the money for the rent. We got to pay the rent. I paid it last month. Everyone's supposed to put the money on the stove, in the kitchen. No, I'm doing what you said you do. We live together. And Jeffrey said, Y'all start just bringing me your money. I'll pay the rent. Y'all stop playing. That's the over there. That's furthering this conspiracy. That's what they did to that man. The next over act is May 13th of 2021. This is the, the chat. It's again, these are the personal conversations not supposed to be seen. These are not released on social media. It's like a wiretap. This is, this is supposed to be between these people. And it's Mr. Martinez Arnold, who, by the way, is a Crip. He's in YSL. Crips are blue, but that's why it's a hybrid gang. Everything moves to make it fit Jeff. Now it's a, now it's a YSL gang that's hybrid. Martina Donald, Miles Farley, Quintavious Greer, that's Jeffrey's brother. Wani Lee, you just learned about him, he's an up and coming rapper, he signed to another label. Jeffrey's promoting his career. He's not even signed to Jeffrey's label. Jeffrey's promoting him. Quintavious Stevens, you learned about him, grew up with Jeffrey. Antonio Sumlin and Jeffrey. And it's May 13, 2021. And Jeffrey wrote, y'all ain't beat him up or shot him yet. Y'all ends getting soft. Well, that sounds bad. But what you will learn is the conversation was about Trontavious Stevens complaining to another person who's in that chat. That other person tried to sleep with Trontavious Stevens' girlfriend. 
And the other person told Shantavis Stevens' girlfriend, Shantavis Stevens is cheating on you with another girl. And Shantavis Stevens and this other man are leveling each other over this chat. And they're going back and forth and back and forth. And this goes on a long time. And Jeffrey, they're acting like kids. And Jeffrey wrote, y'all ain't beat him up or shot him up. Y'all getting soft. He's talking to people that he tries to help and that he's known all his life. That is the overt act. He's totally taken to mislead you. I will present the evidence. And there's no apology accepted when they say, oh, yeah, 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 we're out of contact, we're going to, we, we made a mistake. There's no mistake here. They built a theory. They have an agenda. This is wrong. Objection, argument. Next one. September 1, 2021. Mr. Mender is in the Fulton County Jail. When you're in the Fulton County Jail, not only are your jail calls, like a telephone call recorded, but you can do things with loved ones where you can actually see them, like a FaceTime. Or I guess that's um, Zoom. But they're recorded. So it's about a 16 minute call and then it, it breaks off. It just, you can't talk longer than that on the jail call. You gotta call back and pay your money. And Mr. Mender is speaking with Mr. Huey. And this conversation starts with Mr. Huey driving in a car. You'll see this. And Mr. Mender is on his iPad or whatever, Mac or whatever device he has. And Mr. Huey meets Jeffrey Williams at a jewelry store. Jeffrey has an image. He's very, very visible. He wants to be visible. He promotes his brand. He wears gigantic jewelry all the time. His face tattoos, his tattoos on his body of the bloods of five stars, of his kids' names. He has six children. And his brothers and sisters' names. Of the struggles he's been through. Jonesboro South. And Mr. Huey goes into the jewelry store. And Jeffrey walks up. So now you see Jeffrey in the viewfinder, in the video. And he sees Mr. Mender. And Mr. Mender knows that Mr. Huey's in a jewelry store. And Mr. Huey before that show me. And Mr. Mender says to Jeffrey, hey, I need something. And Jeffrey points to Mr. Huey and says, speak with him, and walks away. Jeffrey's on that video audio for 31 seconds. That promotes the RICO conspiracy that Jeffrey dares to speak with a person who's in custody and treat them well, he didn't buy anything for him. Jeffrey walked away. That's the next opening. The next one is September 4th of 2021, so you, a couple of days later. And Jeffrey is with Mr. Huey. And Mr. Huey puts on his Instagram, it's not Jeffrey's post. Mr. Huey was in custody shortly before this. And he wrote, from lockdown to a jet slap is. Says Jeffrey poses for the photograph. Jeffrey's not even looking at the photographer. Jeffrey doesn't post this. That somehow promotes this conspiracy. This violent, territorial, money gathering, reputation building, fear produ producing, Conspiracy. That's, that's the overt act. 
The next over deck is November 14, 2021. It's again Mr. Huey, Mr. Williams. And Mr. Huey writes, and now this again, this is a private conversation. This is not social media. And Mr. Huey wrote, you know I'm ready to handle the business and go sit down if I got to about any one of y'all on my mama. What the prosecution leaves out is the next line by Mr. Huey, where Mr. Huey writes, but I don't even know if this is true or not. And Jeffrey writes, have you spoken with Gunner or Sergio Kitchens? And Mr. Huey responds, yes. And what they're talking about, if you remember right before COVID of 2020, Jeffrey is telling Mr. Huey, get those people to return those beats. Those beats are not ever coming back. They're lost. That is propriety information. That is, that is valuable art. They're gone. Mr. Steele, I hate to interrupt you, but you don't mind the time. How much longer do you have? An hour? We're going to take a couple of breaks this time. Ten minutes, okay? All right, we're going to recess.